Welcome, everyone. Or I guess I should be welcoming myself. You all come here regularly. <laughs> As Laura said, my uh, official name is Swami Nikilanan, but most people call me Bhaya, which is probably easier, which means brother in Hindi. And uh, I'm a Hindu monk who has been uh, studying Eastern philosophy and Hinduism in particular for 14 years, not as long as Laura. I've been fortunate enough to spend a lot of time in India and also at our main center, a uh, main ashram or spiritual retreat center in Austin, Texas, which is where I call home now. And uh, I'll be sharing with you today and in the next two sessions as well some things uh, that I have found particularly useful from Eastern philosophy that can be applied directly to your life, your relationships, and uh, you know, to make you feel more successful in the way you're living your life. So today, the topic is going to be the difference between the outer world and the inner world. But before I get started on that and how we can use this information to make us feel more uh, secure and stable in our life, I usually start by singing a Sanskrit prayer. And after that, we'll do a little bit of chanting where you'll have the chance to join in. First, I'll, I'll just sing a prayer. And after that, I'll, I'll be chanting like a, a one line, uh, which you can also repeat and respond to if you'd like. The, the line that I'll be repeating is just Radhe, Radhe, Govinda. So Radhe and Govinda, two words or two names, Sanskrit names that we'll be repeating. I'll explain more why we do that later, but uh, in, in the beginning, all you have to think of is just relaxing, bring your attention into your heart, and just receive the vibration of the chanting. That's it. You can have your eyes open or closed. It's up to you. And uh, just, just try to feel the vibration, the spiritual vibration of the chanting. So after the prayer, when I start chanting the Radhe Govinda chanting, you're welcome to respond to the line when I sing it. Then you can actually chant out loud if you would like. And if you'd rather not, there will be a few people definitely chanting. And the rest of you, if you just want to sit and listen, that's fine too. Yeah, yeah, the 
something that's been on everybody's mind at least the last few years more than uh, when I was growing up and that's stability so it's something that we look for all of us we, we hope to find something stable that we can count on and that whatever we have we don't want to lose it so we want security 
We want something that's going to last. And if we can get it, we want to guarantee that those things are going to last. <laughs> but the reality is, I mean, we all know from our own life that how often do we get a guarantee, or never mind a guarantee, how often do we actually get something that does last? So we want one thing and our experience is something else. There's nobody who doesn't want security and stability, who wouldn't want to hang on to the things that they love. Yet all of us experience that the world is unpredictable, unstable, always changing. Whether it's relationships, none of us can control another person's thinking. We would like to have a guarantee that the people that we love are going to love us back as much as we want them to, and that their thinking won't change, and that they'll keep loving us for the rest of our life. We would love to have a guarantee that our investments are going to give us this amount of money every year without change for as long as we live. We'd love to have a guarantee that no matter what we do at work, our boss won't fire us, or if we own our own business, that we'll be successful. We'd love to have such guarantees, but we know it doesn't work that way. And that disturbs us. It makes us feel anxious. It makes us, we feel sorrow when we lose things. So it's a, it's a problem. It's a problem uh, we may not always acknowledge openly, but it's something we all feel deep inside ourselves. So how, to gain some insight into this situation and how it is possible to feel stable even when the world is not stable, we'll turn to Eastern philosophy. Eastern philosophy has a lot of um, different ways of looking at life. And nowadays, you know, we call it Eastern philosophy, but it's certainly made its way into the West. It's very common, and uh, I'm sure you've all been exposed in one way or another to the teachings of Hinduism or Buddhism or Taoism. You've all done some reading or some studying, and what I'm going to uh, share with you today is probably nothing new for you, but maybe the way that I'm going to frame it will, will make it something that you can apply easily in your life. So speaking of Eastern philosophies, I named a few main ones, Hindu philosophy, Buddhist philosophy, Taoist philosophy. These are some of the most popular ones that came out of the, the Orient that are influencing thinking in the West today. And although I studied a little bit of each of those, I, I went into much more detail with Hindu philosophy. And in fact, Buddhism, you can say, is, a, is an outgrowth or a branch of Hindu philosophy. And Taoist philosophy is, uh, from, from what I've studied, is basically it uh, dovetails perfectly with Hindu philosophy. So what I'm going to share with you today, you can say is, uh, would, would be acceptable in any of those philosophies. But it's particularly, the detail I'm going to give you is uh, in particular from a Hindu background. Uh, the Hindu scriptures such as the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayan, Mahabharat, these may be some of the, you may have heard of some of these, certainly the Gita I think most people have heard of nowadays. So what Hinduism teaches us about the world is that there are in fact two worlds, the outer world and the inner world. The outer world is the one we try to control when in fact we should be trying to control this one. The outer world is, you know, we try to say, oh, I want to keep my job. I want to have my investment portfolio giving me this much in return. I want all these people to behave in this way to make me feel good. <laughs> we try, we, if we could, we would control all of that and have it just how we want. But as I was saying, that's not our experience. And there's a reason for that. That is not the nature of that outer world. We all have an inner world, and we all live in the same outer world. 
our inner world is personal. No one knows what, what we're thinking. God knows. No one else knows. So we have some privacy in our inner world, at least from each other. But the outer world we share. And the outer world is made of an energy called maya. In the Sanskrit scriptures, the word maya means the material energy or the, uh, the cosmic energy. So there's one single energy that evolved into the form of this amazing universe. So this outer world is made of maya. And mayic energy has certain characteristics which are always there. And one of those characteristics is constant change. Nothing is ever stable. Everything is always in motion and changing. Just like, uh, you know, physics says the law of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, energy is always in a state of change. It's always changing from a higher level to a lower level. Life, as we know it, goes against that law of entropy and it creates situations where there's more organization and more subtlety and entropy breaks it down but it, either way we're in a state of constant change we know that every cell in our body is replaced every seven years we know that if you go on an even more subtle level and look within an atom you can never say at any one time where are the electrons of that atom. You can predict with some probability where an electron is, but they're moving so fast and constantly. So when these are the building blocks of the world we live in, and they're in constant motion, how can we expect the, the things that are made out of them to be stable? They're not. So that's why life begins and ends for our physical body. The day begins and ends. The seasons keep rotating. It's just everywhere you look, there's constant change in this world. And it applies to relationships because everybody's living their own life, even if you're together in your life. But there are certain things affecting each individual which are maybe not affecting another. And those things keep changing, so that person's thinking is going to keep changing and their needs are going to keep changing. So relationships keep changing. The economy <coughs> also follows this trend of up and down, just like day and night, seasons, life and death. Everything has a cycle in this world. So the economy also has its ups and downs ups and downs every day on the stock market or if you take you know a larger perspective over decades there are larger ups and downs this is the nature of every facet of our existence so this outer world can never be controlled <laughs> there is there's no such power that can give you the ability to control the economy or another person or your boss or your business, even your business is, is subject to uh, other people's thinking and to the, the whims, the ups and downs of the world. So there's, there's no way to predict anything, there's no way to control anything in this outer world. That's basically what it comes down to and, and that's what we try to do. And when we fail, we feel loss, we feel disappointment, we feel disheartened sometimes. So the first step what uh, this Hindu philosophy can teach us is to accept that the outer world is what it is. It is going to keep changing. But luckily there's another world. There's the inner world and that world is the more important one. And that's where we should be focusing our attention. The inner world is the world of our own thinking. You can say our mind. That's our inner world. That's where we think, we feel, it's our emotions, our desires, our attachments. That's our inner world. That world is controlled and created by us. And it doesn't have to be affected by the outer world, although it is, but it doesn't have to be. 
I'll give you an example of how we create this inner world. Is it, no one else does it but our own self. How do we fall in love? Some people say love at first sight. I would say attraction at first sight is possible. Love at first sight is not. Love is something that develops. It's, a, it's an attachment, actually, that we create to another person through our thinking. We start thinking, this person is beautiful. This person behaves in such, oh, they're so funny. They're so charming. They make me feel so good. Every time you have a positive thought about that person, you're increasing your attachment to them. The more you think about them, the more attached you get. And the more attached you are, the more you think about them. So it keeps compounding. The same is true with hate. You start thinking something about someone, you, the person doesn't change. See, let's say there's someone you notice. Maybe they're a colleague. You were with them for several days or several weeks when you first came to the office and you were just neutral. And then you noticed something about them that annoyed you or that you really disliked. You started dwelling on that thing. I really dislike it when that person does that. Oh, that ticks me off. And then you notice something else and something else and you start dwelling on those things or meditating on them even, you could say. And your negative attachment to that person is growing. So now just like the person that you love comes in your mind all the time, the person that you dislike also comes in your mind. Because both are forms of attachment. A positive attachment we call love, a negative attachment we call hate. Both are our creation. We created both of those situations. The person is what they are. Now we can even reverse it. Someone that you love, you created a loving attachment with that person. Let's say you find out that they said something about you behind your back, or they did something behind your back. They, they broke your trust. They weren't loyal to you. Then that same love, in fact, in an instant, can turn to hate. Because that attachment is there. It's a big attachment. And the people that we're attached to, if they hurt us, then the dislike for them <laughs> will be equal to the love that we had for them. Oh, that person said that about me? It just changes. Our thinking about that person changes. And now when we see them, Whereas previously, when we saw that person that we loved, we felt happy. Now when we see them, we feel disturbed, we feel pain even. What if you find out, oh no, the person who told you that they said that thing about you, they were mistaken. In <laughs> fact, they didn't say anything bad about you, they were loyal to you. Someone else said something and they defended you. Oh, you're, you're thinking again. <laughs> reverses and the same love returns the hate is gone so we see from that that this inner world is our creation our mind is there but the the emotions that we feel those emotions are our creation which are completely dependent on our positive or negative thinking about a person a thing or any situation let's say you had a wedding ring and you were happily married for many years and something happened, your spouse left you. So while you were happily married, the sight of your wedding ring gave you great happiness, reminded you of your love for your spouse. Now that she or he is gone, if you kept that wedding ring, now when you see it, you feel pain because someone that you loved is no longer with you. They're gone. Is there happiness or unhappiness in the wedding ring? No. It's all dependent on your thinking. The same ring, it, let's say it's gold. There's no happiness in the gold. It's just a piece of metal. But what it reminds you of makes, it makes you feel happy. And then later, because the situation changed, the very same substance, the very same gold ring makes you feel unhappy. 
So the outer world is what it is. The ring is a real thing. It's a real part of this outer world. A person is a real part of this outer world. That is a real thing. But our thinking about the person or the thing, that's very unstable. It, it can change in a moment. So those emotions are our own creations. So now we understand <clears throat> the difference between the outer world and the inner world. The question is how to find stability. If we look for stability in outer things, what we end up doing is every single up and down that happens is going to create a similar effect in here. Meaning, if we look for happiness in another person, as I said, we have no guarantee that this person is going to keep loving me or even if they do keep loving me, will their behavior always make me happy? No, that never happens in any relationship. But if I've attached myself to that person with this goal in mind, that they are going to make me happy through their behavior, through their love for me, then your inner feelings are bound to go up and down with their love for you or their behavior towards you. The more they love you, the higher you get inside. Whenever they disappoint you, the lower you get inside. So we can't have stability if our, our desire is to find, if, if we're attached in the outer world, we can never find stability. Same thing with money or business. If our happiness is dependent on the success of our business or the success of our career or our finances, then our inner happiness is going to go up and down with the stock market or with the, with the success or failure of our business. So the key is to turn inside and inside even deeper than our own emotions. There's a place inside which is so deep it can't be touched by anything that's happening out there. You can think of it kind of like the ocean. There could be a hurricane blowing on the surface of the ocean. <clears throat> so if you're up there on the surface, you're in for a rough ride. But as you come below the surface, it gets calmer and calmer and calmer and calmer. And if you come all the way down to the bottom, it's perfectly calm all the time, no matter what's happening up there. So we have a place inside like that, which is always perfectly calm. It's our deepest self. We call it in Sanskrit, Atma, soul. Our soul is impervious to the ups and downs of the world. So what I'm telling you is, that our anchor has to be in here, not out there. If we try to anchor, meaning we're, we're attaching ourselves out there with the hope of finding happiness, because the outer world is never stable, it's always changing, then we're, we're relegating ourselves to a life of constant ups and downs. But if our anchor is in here, then we have a guarantee then we have stability. But, but the question is how to get that anchor on the inside. You need to connect to your deepest self and maintain that connection and foster that connection so that no matter what's happening out there, you're always the same in here. And the fact is you are always the same, but we just don't connect to that. Our Sanskrit scriptures tell us that your soul cannot be cut by any weapon. Nainam chindanti shastrani, Gita says. No shastra, no weapon can, can slice or cut or touch your soul. Nainam dahati pavakaha, your soul can't be burnt by fire. It can't be made wet by water, it can't be dried out by the wind because it's divine. 
this world is material and the soul is in fact beyond the world even though we are all individual souls and we're all living in this world yet we're beyond the world we'll talk more in the next session about what our total personality is that we're made up of a physical body a mind and a soul but for for today you can just remember this much that your soul is divine and your body belongs to this world so it's also temporary like the world but your soul is your true self so soul cannot be made unhappy by the world nor can it be made happy by the world Gita also says Matra sparshas tu kaunteya Shitoshna sukha dukha da Sama dukha sukham dhiram somritatvaya kalpate The person who realizes that the world is full of opposites good and bad, happy and sad, day and night, life and death, beauty and ugliness. The world is full of such opposites which always keep oscillating and alternating. So the one who realizes that doesn't get attached to anything in the outer world, but instead stays anchored here deep inside. And in that way, sama dukkha sukham dhiram. Dhiram means a wise person. Stays the same in all the situations, whether it's a duk or suk. Duk means suffering. And suk means pleasure. In either situation, he doesn't get perturbed or agitated on the inside because he's anchored deep inside. So the soul is beyond all the ups and downs of the world. <clears throat> In fact, soul is eternal. Ajame kam lohit shukla krishnam bahvi praja srijamanam sarupa ajo yeko jushamano nushete jahatye nam bhukta bhogam ajo Our Upanishads tell us that the soul was never born. Soul has existed for eternity and can never die. Ajo nitya shashvato yam purano nahanyate hanyamane sharire. The Gita says that the soul is not even killed by the physical death of your body. That doesn't do anything to your soul. Your soul just changes scenery. It goes on and takes another body. So that's the first step to finding stability is understanding that we are not this body. This body is a temporary possession just like the car you drove to get here. You haven't had it for your whole life. It hasn't been since eternity joined with you. In the same way, this body is a temporary vehicle for us to get around in, for me to get around in, and me means the soul. So just like you sit inside your car to go somewhere, you are inside your body. You are not the body. That's step number one. And step number two is to realize that you, as the soul, cannot be affected by anything in this outer world. Your mind can be affected, that's up here on the surface, but down here at the deepest part of who you are, your soul, the world cannot touch you. And you are eternal. So imagine you will survive even the death of this body. Then what can any up or down of this world do to you? Can't do anything. It's kind of like a, an imagined fear we have of losing things. I used to work before I became a sannyasi. Sannyasi means a, a monk, a Hindu monk. Before that, I used to work in the outdoor adventure industry. So I used to take people rock climbing and you know 
on high ropes courses and low ropes courses. And uh, we used to teach, uh, you know, leadership and trust and all of these things through through these activities. And there's a, an in industry terminology, like in every industry, two terms that we use are perceived risk and real risk, or perceived danger and real danger. So when you have someone tied to a rock climbing rope and they're climbing up the crag, their perceived danger is very high because they're, they feel exposed. They're on the edge of this rock. They're hanging on by the tips of their fingers and it looks like a long way down. But the real danger is less than walking down the sidewalk because I've got the other end of the rope. So there's no real danger, but the perceived danger is very high. Something like that, we have so many perceived dangers in this world. Oh, if this person stops loving me, let's see, that's a fear. We feel that's a danger. Oh no, how will I survive? I'll be so hurt. If I lose this thing, how will I survive? We have so many perceived dangers, yet none of it can touch us in here. We're impervious to that, but the key is to connect to that deep part of yourself. Then you can live, it's a process, <laughs> but the more you do that, the more you can live fearlessly in the world with, with joy and, and uh, abandon. Not to mean that you don't plan things in your life and decide I'm going to try to attain this goal and to do that, I'm going to do these steps in order. You do plan things in that way, but, but you're willing to uh, take the risk to do those things without worrying that am I going to fail? If you fail, you'll survive. So now what I'd like to do is take a few more minutes to do some chanting because through this chanting you'll get a chance to connect with your own self more deeply. It's a form of meditation but it's a very easy form of meditation. Just like I told you in the beginning all you have to do is bring your attention to your heart. Well this heart area, not the physical heart but the center of your chest, the spiritual heart, is the seat of the soul. Your soul is in here. So you should bring your attention in there. I'll encourage you to close your eyes if you're comfortable with closed eyes. If you'd like to have them open, that's fine. So just feel that you are inside your body. That's it. Bring your attention to your heart area and feel that you are in there. The real you is in there. You're not your body, but you are actually inside your body. And then just breathe in a relaxed way. And while maintaining that uh, connection with your inner self, we'll do some chanting just as we did previously. And as I said before, you're welcome to chant out loud if you'd like. And if you'd like to just listen in silence and uh, absorb the vibrations, that's fine as well. Adhirathe Govinda Bhajo Radhe Radhe
one other thing that really completes today's topic, and that is that I've been talking about connecting to yourself, connecting deep inside, but there's something even deeper than that. And that is, you know, if you, you say, okay, my soul is eternal, I'm eternal, but what is my source? What is, what is giving life to me? What if I could connect to that? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, we call different words or different names in different languages in different countries. You can call that God. Um, we, we've been chanting Radhe, Govinda. Those are two Sanskrit names of God from India. Different people call the source by different names but uh, that that source or that that divine source you can even connect to God in that way however you think of God however you know by whatever name you you call God by whatever form or, or no form or whatever God is to you if you just think that okay I'm here I'm deep inside but there's there's a divine benefactor who's, who's giving life to the inside of my soul and I can connect to him or I can connect to her. So that adds another, another level. And if you, if you think as well that uh, Hinduism, uh, as well as many other religions, teach that God is in fact perfect happiness and perfect love so you can think like a fountain of bliss the soul itself is spot existent and limited but God is omnipresent all powerful all blissful all the time and one single God is giving life to unlimited souls simultaneously. And one single God is simultaneously with every single soul. So we have an eternal relationship with God. And, and this is something, see if I, for me personally, if someone just taught me that you are the soul and you're eternal and you're deep inside, that in a way is scary to me because I feel alone when I think about that that, oh, I'm not attached anywhere in the world, and just my soul is eternal. That's, I just think of, you know, outer space, and <laughs> just, like vast nothingness, and, and my soul there in that vast nothingness. That, that's the kind of imagery that pops into my head. So it, it's like I'm looking for something more than just connecting to myself. I want to connect to someone. So we have a divine, eternal relationship with God, which is so deep that you couldn't get any deeper. God is within our soul, giving life to our soul. Simultaneously, God is beside us, in front of us, on the other side, behind us, above us, below us. Wherever you can think of God, God is there. So there's no separation. You, you can never be apart from God. You never have to be lonely. Connecting to that, if it's something that uh, resonates with you, it can be something that, that gives you... It's really the missing piece. Just connecting to yourself may not be enough. You want to connect to something greater than yourself. And then why not connect to the fountain of eternal bliss? If you really connect to that, that kind of opens up a flow of contentment and blissfulness within yourself it's it's there it's just lying dormant and when you connect to God in in that way not only your soul within yourself but also God who's giving life to your soul then you make it's like you can say there's a dam you know holding back a, a huge reservoir of water and you just open open the gate the floodgate a little bit a little bit of the water starts coming out something like that as you connect inside a little bit of that starts bubbling up into your heart and and you feel happy and content a little bit more than before so that's what i was uh 
trying to explain that the more you practice that, the more that the more deep that connection becomes, not only with yourself, but with your divine source. Then that contentment starts to pervade your body, your being, and and not only when you're meditating, eventually it spills over just into your general consciousness as you're walking and talking and living your life. But but that takes time. You have to develop that connection by doing what we've been doing here today. And eventually there there's actually an ultimate goal. It's not just about trying to find something that, that makes us uh, feel happy and content in this life, but actually an ultimate happiness forever. Uh, that's the ultimate goal, but I'll be saving more of that talk for the next session when we talk about what we really want, what we're really looking for. So um, does anyone else have any final questions before I finish with a couple minutes of chanting? We have just a few minutes left. I ha should I announce now or after you finish? Hey, let's do it after. Okay. So you can keep in mind next time that I'll surprise you with a chance to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll think of something during the week and you can write it down and bring your question next time. So we'll have one more short meditation and if you'd like you can add in this uh, last piece which I mentioned about not only connecting to yourself, go inside and feel that you are not the body but in fact you are within your body and then also feel your connection with God. If you want to feel like a, a divine friendly presence in front of you or near you or you just feel that inside you your soul is there and, and next to your soul God is there, either of those would be fine. Thank you.
Yeah. 